everyone, to welcome everybody here. And if you're not aware of the fact this is the, uh, the Linux hot yoga session, <laughs> we do want to introduce people just to let you know that we didn't just meet on the street. Uh, so just as to who we are and why we're here. Hey, folks. Oh, wow. Hey, folks. Uh, I'm Shankar Narayan. I'm the Technology and Liberty Project Director for the ACLU of Washington. Uh, you know, I started out my career as a technology and IT attorney, so I'm not a technologist, but I play one on TV every once in a while. Uh, and I'm here to, to answer any questions you may have about civil liberties. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, you know, confined to tech-related issues, I just wanted to say that. And I'm Stephen Reisler. I'm actually a practicing attorney. Uh, I am a user. I think I'm one of the few attorneys, if maybe only one of two, in the state of Washington who runs a complete suite of uh, GNU Linux free and open source software and have since 2004. I'm past chair of the Seattle chapter of the National Lawyers Guild and a past member of the Board of Governors of the State Bar Association, past chair of the Washington Commission on Judicial Conduct. All right, I am Benjamin Mako Hill. I usually go by Mako. I am an assistant professor at the University of Washington in the Department of Communication, and I've got some, I don't know, kind of like tendrils out into the School of Engineering as well. Uh, I have uh, a long background in the free software movement. I've been a participant in the Debian project in the, uh, and was part of the team that helped start Ubuntu. Um, now a long time ago, uh, and uh, then made a sort of transition into studying free and open source software projects. I'm on the board of directors of the Free Software Foundation and uh, the advisory board for the Wikimedia Foundation, and uh, I think that <coughs> most of my kind of relevant expertise in terms of legal matters pertain to things like um, open access, issues around copyright and licensing, um, and yeah, stuff in that space. Uh, I'm Will Scott. I recently finished a PhD in the computer science department at University of Washington looking at uh, technical measurement of censorship and surveillance online. Uh, and I'm on the board of directors for Cell Privacy Coalition, uh, looking at sort of advocacy around privacy issues uh, and civil liberties on that side uh, at the local level. What we were doing today is we are going to be selecting from a smorgasbord of issues that seem to be coming up with increasing frequency uh, that are of interest to all of us and to all of you. And if they're not of interest to all of you, they will strike you right in the face uh, as I choose my words carefully. And so we are simply going through some things that have been uppermost presented in the mainstream and the not mainstream media and things that are not appearing in either one of them for commentary by each one of us. And I know that Two of us came up together in one vehicle, and there's at least one topic that's of major concern. And Mako, what was that one topic? Oh gosh, I think you had something to say about all of them. Uh, well, let's <laughs> pick the first. The first one I think that comes up is the is the question, of course, is what is going to happen to um, network neutrality? There is a new FCC chair who has indicated his distinct bias for eliminating network neutrality, but there was also a recent decision. I believe by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, saying that they that that body, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is one step removed from the United States Supreme Court, has said that it will not be reviewing the challenge to the FCC's net neutrality <coughs> rules. Does that give you a springboard? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so we're uh, back in interesting times as the administration has changed and is trying to take a different um, policy towards towards how we regulate the internet uh, in the US. Uh, I talked about this a little bit this morning. Uh, and so this the, the brief thing, right, is that we are trying to figure out what level of consumer protection and what we want out of these broadband carriers. A lot of people in the US have one broadband service provider, right? So once you get out of metro areas, uh, you're often in a monopoly position where there's one provider. Uh, and the government has traditionally been the one that puts the consumer protection in place to say, uh, these companies that are getting access and are providing this common service as a utility, 
uh, should have some regulation on what they do. Uh, and that comes both in the form of uh, having to serve everyone, even the customers that cost a lot of money to lay fiber to, um, that, that we want some sort of, you know, you are providing to everyone, not just the people who make you money. Um, and then also restrictions on uh, sort of how much you are allowed to manipulate that network. Uh, and so, you know, if, if one of your competitors wants to send packets over the network, you need to let them do it at the same price as, um, as you know, when you are sending your own video or, or whatever. Um, and the, the shift that we are seeing for Trump uh, and, and this current FCC uh, policy is saying, well, by having less regulation coming from the government, we can potentially allow for uh, you know, specific companies, probably more the large companies, to throw a bunch of money into making their service better faster. Um, so you can, um, you know, get, you know, your YouTube videos very fast because Google is going to see a direct benefit of, you know, building out the wires to its data centers on all of these consumer ISPs. Uh, and the downside is when the next guy comes, uh, they won't necessarily get to use those lines uh, or won't be able to use them at the same price. Um, so. It's going to keep evolving. Uh, we'll see in four years or eight years. You know, hopefully it flips the other way and we go back to, to saying that everything needs to be fair again. The topic of net neutrality is kind of, you know, that hits everyone here. And you, um, Why don't you stand up and then we can all hear you. Usually I've been told I have too loud of a voice. Everyone hear me? Yeah, so net neutrality is obviously a very sensitive topic nowadays, especially those of us who are really open source, open lots of things, including maybe government and other aspects. What kind of jurisdiction do the local governments really have over this? It feels, as I'm, I study into this, because I'm not an expert in local law, uh, but dealing as a, my background in a, as a ham operator, as example, SEC has a jurisdiction and other jurisdictions where you can't say anything about it. Is this now shifting from the SEC to the FTC? And can local governments, say like Seattle City mm -hmm. or King County or Whatcom County, really influence neutrality in those jurisdictional areas? So that is an excellent question, and it's a very disputed question as well. Uh, not only for the issue of net neutrality, but uh, as many of you have heard, uh, the uh, rules around broadband privacy that didn't go into place, they almost became so close to getting them, and then they were yanked away by Congress, and uh, that bill was signed by President Trump. And in both of those cases, the, the question, one of the questions, of course, is preemption, right? So does the federal government uh, have indicated a an intent to occupy that whole field, or can local regulations coexist with federal regulations and in some, in some cases go further? Uh, you know, that's one argument that's been used. Uh, you'll often see, uh, especially in the case of the uh, ISPs uh, around this, this fight on broadband privacy, they also assert commercial speech rights, right? So they, they argue under the First Amendment that you know we have, this is, this is protected speech, and we have the right to disseminate your entire browsing history, which of course we don't uh, we don't agree with. That's uh, we we don't think that's a good argument. Um, and then you know there there are very practical concerns as well, right? To some degree, it's also an issue of risk management for a local jurisdiction. So, for example, Seattle uh, around these ISPs just put in place a rule that that, that prohibits them from uh, selling that information, right? But I think uh, from speaking to policymakers in Seattle. Uh, it seems very clear that they expect to get sued. They probably will get sued by the ISPs. And so uh, it's also a matter of which jurisdictions have the political will to be able to, to do that. I think in Seattle, the calculation is that if you get sued uh, while you're standing up for people's privacy, you look like a hero, and that actually gives you some political cred. That may not be the case in, in, in other places. Uh, so that, that's sort of been the contours of the fight. I also want to make a plug just uh, you know, on, on the topic of the, uh, the ISPs and the, uh, the, the rules prohibiting them uh, from buying and selling your, your browsing history. Uh, there is actually a bill that's alive in Olympia. As you know, we have a special session going on right now. Uh, the, and it 
basically, uh, although it doesn't cover use by the ISPs themselves, which is unfortunate, it does cover sale and transfer of the personal information they derive from providing you uh, the, the, the internet service that they do. Uh, you know, it's, it's better than nothing. Uh, it's not uh, as, as good as we would want it to be. But we are hoping to see it move because you know, our, our fear is after a year, right, this won't quite be the hot topic that it is. And I think that's what the ISPs are counting on. They're counting on people forgetting that, that, that they cared about privacy. They just write it out this year and next year they don't have to deal with the bill. So if you have a, a lawmaker who you have a relationship with or you've never seen your lawmaker, you should look up who it is. Uh, and, uh, and particularly in the Senate, which is the main sticking point, uh, call them and tell them that you like HB 2200 to move. As a practicing attorney, I have a slightly different take on it, and I'm much more cynical about, for example, the city of Seattle municipal government, um, because I think um, I'm very concerned we're right now in an age of political gestures, and I'm not very impressed with gestures. I look at something like the city of Tacoma, which has taken a preliminary step, which is a much more effective way. I think when the city of Seattle gets sued, it will lose. Uh, and politically, they are setting themselves up as the good guys, which I think is nice, because I think they do have the right intention. But I think the problem is going to be that Seattle doesn't own the system. In Tacoma, they actually do or there is a small municipal network. They own it, it's theirs, and by contract, they can determine the rules of what's going to happen within the system. You don't get into preemption when it's your system, your cable network. You do have a problem when you don't own it, and that's when you start running into these issues, of, and preemption means simply that the, the federal government, because we're a national system, it has filled the space, so to speak, and there isn't room for a lot of local, like local currencies that we no longer have 50 states issuing 50 different items of currency because it would be chaos. And so that rule of logic applies to all of these other issues and particularly fills in with telecommunications. Tacoma has passed similar types of measures to protect the privacy of their people, but they can do it for the 23 or 26,000 subscribers they have because it's their system. And if you don't want to subscribe to their rules, Comcast, whoever it may be, then don't use it. It's real simple. It's an issue of contract law. So I'm looking to pe for people to be, to look at things <coughs> at a much more fundamental level, which is not just to petition your politicians to do something, but you take ownership of it yourself. Own it. And when you own it, you can control it. Sir, uh, I, I really like that piece about owning it and uh, controlling it. Um, what I'm really curious about is, uh, it seems like if we really were really focused on trying to solve this problem on the side of, like, let's have laws so that people can't sell our data and like view our data and stuff, um, and that seems still entirely faith based. And I would love to trust everybody, but I don't trust very many people. Um, <laughs> So when we talk about like taking it into our own hand, like using systems like Tor or getting on a VPN or ensuring that we're operating on an SSL, uh, I'm kind of curious where laws start to break down over there. Because uh, there's kind of talk, I'm very, you know, I'm not a liar, I don't really know any of what you guys know. Uh, but it seems like, you know, you can get put on a list if you search for the Tails operating system or if you search Tor, or now that I've set it, a microphone is picking me up or I'm screwed. Uh, so what kind of, like what protections do we have to at least get us that far? <laughs> what was your name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, did everyone hear that or should we try to repeat the question? And you could always repeat for video too. Okay. So I think the question was, are you likely to get put on a list for searching for Tor or other <laughs> privacy protection mechanisms? And how do you prevent that from happening? Uh, yeah. Like I said, in the simplest form, like uh, if we can't trust the people around us, can we at least trust that we can get far enough to take it into our own hands? Yeah, I mean, I think, as far as I know, there are not lists of 
everyone who has searched for Tor. Maybe Google has this list, but I don't think they have uh, sold this, to my knowledge, to anyone else. Um, I feel like that would be a pretty uh, clear First Amendment uh, problem, or, or, or I guess fourth, maybe? Somewhere, somewhere in there, just like keeping a list of everyone who's looking for the ability to speak freely seems like that's a core civil liberty that, that we have and feels like it would be slimy enough that people would be willing to go after that if that sort of collection was happening. Um, that, that, we, that we would see people trying to find legal ways to go after anyone who's collecting that sort of list of people who are using uh, tools to prevent surveillance. Um, and so I, mean, I think you do identify a significant challenge, which is that in the area of privacy and surveillance, you know, while I don't disagree with anything that's been said, I think it is true that the, the, the protections that we have currently are inadequate, right? We have uh, the Constitution, which is really only a floor, right? It's a, it's a bare minimum, and in most cases has generally not been applied right to to instances like this so we really don't know how a case like that would come out uh, often it applies to government actors as well right like the fourth amendment around search is, is really uh, you know if the government comes and searches you uh, and then uh, you know the, the other problem is that the statutes have also not kept up now i i, I will say uh, uh, that the legislatures are in a far better position to address this problem than the courts are. The courts tend to not be particularly savvy about technology and they also tend to be limited by the facts of the specific case in front of them, whereas the legislatures have the ability to look at the picture as a whole and, and try to figure out what, uh, what policy is going to address it. Uh, having said that, you know, there are specific protections, going back to this idea that the locals can go beyond what exists at the state and, and the federal mm -hmm. level. Uh, you know, Seattle, for example, has had an intelligence ordinance for quite a long time, since the, 19, the late 1970s, that was precipitated exactly by the kind of information collection you're talking about, right? Cops were basically following activists around, uh, collecting their information, putting it in dossiers. It used to matter less at that time because it would go gather dust in a filing cabinet in the corner of some law enforcement uh, storeroom, right? Now that's no longer the case, right? Now we have uh, local fusion centers that feed into the statewide fusion center that feeds to the federal government. So you then have a problem as to uh, once the information is collected and, and archived, it actually gets shared all over the place and it follows you around in ways that, that are very challenging. But I do think the solution is at the local level with things like the Seattle Intelligence Ordinance. Now our rewrite to the Seattle uh, Surveillance Ordinance as well, which, which puts limits on data sharing and a public and accountable transparent process around acquisition of surveillance technologies. I encourage every jurisdiction to do that. And if you're in Bellingham, you may be interested in, in doing something similar. One more on this, or one more on this, briefly. I, mean, I think the core thing that systems like Tor are saying is by having uh, these more privacy-protecting technical systems used widely, you are reducing your risk, right? So we're at a world already where 10%, something like that, of people use ad blockers. That that's now pretty normalized. The fact that you are using an ad blocker is not going to potentially like target you as the activist anymore. That's not something that we think of as a sensitive uh, thing that we do at this point. It's just something that people do and, and becomes normalized. And so by having more people use these systems, we reduce our, our risk to, to being surveilled, right? So as something becomes ubiquitous, it becomes less of a problem. So by, by advocating and bringing these things into the mainstream, we are able to make them be less of a problem, right? So if you get the signal end-to-end -end encryption into WhatsApp, now suddenly everyone's using it and we don't worry about is this a thing that we even need to you know, be tracked because we're using it because it's just, it, it's the thing that you use by default. That was great. Is there a question? question? So we constantly go back and forth with the corporations in, in court over what they can and can't sell. Um, longer term, would it be a better solution to just mis misplace broadband services and what sort of hurdles would we face in Washington, 
The question was asked is what can we do on a municipal basis to actually engage Just cut them out instead of worrying about the mechanic and sell like longer term. What can yeah. we do on a local yes. level to cut out the transnational and national corporations and do it ourselves? I say make the effort. If you don't try, you'll never succeed. Uh, and it'll be a hell of a lot of work. Generations long. Sir. Could you use taxation uh, at the Seattle level? You personally, the question is, can you use taxation at the local level? And I will be confident in saying that you personally cannot. No, but the yeah. city might. <laughs> and that means you need to take control of the city government. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm one of these. I'm not a big fan of the systems as it currently exists, although I recognize there is no ideal system. I'm simply saying you can never rely on somebody else to do it for you just because you call them and you petition them. It's work. It lasts forever. Um, I was just going to add. I think uh, you know my experience has been, and I've I've been uh, lobbying legislatures for quite a while. Uh, that you know they really take advantage of the fact that most legislative process happens behind closed doors, and there aren't people engaged enough to to apply pressure. Right. I have seen tremendous amounts of money and massive numbers of lobbyists flung at Olympia and Seattle by the ISPs, right? They, they really have, have gone all in on this fight and they're continuing to do that. In fact, they have been going around in Olympia around this HB 2200, the broadband privacy bill saying, you know, if, if you ex legislator vote for this, we are going to run an opponent against you and do everything we can to unseat you, right? And they, they have the power to do that. Really, the, the power that we have is public scrutiny, transparency, and accountability, right? So lawmakers do listen to constituents, right? They, they, they count votes. And so I think the, the way to balance that is actually getting, getting more people engaged in the legislative mm -hmm. process. And on the issue of surveillance in particular, it just, you know, this stuff thrives even, even in a liberal place like Seattle because they think you're not paying attention. Uh, so when Tom Wheeler passed Title II regulations on the ISPs, the ISPs basically sued and tried to tie it up in the courts as much as possible. Can uh, the internet and content companies do the same for the revocation of Title II regulations uh, and basically sue the FCC to prevent them from doing that? I think if I repeat the question distilled to its essence is can the big uh, telecom and internet companies tie up the FCC with litigation going into the future? Uh, to prevent net neutrality to from being uh, 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 rescinded. rescinded. To prevent net neutrality from being rescinded. I think the simple answer is <coughs> yes, but ultimately it's going to end up in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Sounds like a good answer. Good answer. <laughs> my, only, my only sub note on all the stuff about you know the dossiers that have been made in the past is, by the way, you're making them yourself. You know, we are all making our own do-it-yourself DIY dossiers. Every time you do everything, I mean, five copies at a minimum are being kept, and one of them's going to um, Utah. So, I mean, we're doing it ourselves. Uh, the dossiers are there. Quick question, sir. Yeah, uh, it seems like what I've, what I've read, uh, Ajit Pai is talking about not only rescinding the, the legislation, but making it permanent. Um, is, is there a quick way of explaining how that is different from when the rules were put in place, when we were put the rules in place, and just how that's, how that's different? Is there a quick way of explaining that? I don't think I understand. I don't understand. So, uh, I don't know. Well, it seems like when I, when I read, uh, Ajit Pai is talking about making this so it can't be revisited again. Mm. And, uh, I was just wondering why Wheeler didn't put that in place when yeah. you may be yeah, I mean you may be thinking about you may be thinking about a piece of the actual bill that was sent uh, by Congress to President Trump uh, that that basically was a no look back provision that, that said these are the rules and that's it. Uh, you know, that may be litigated. We don't know if that will stick, but that was that was a part of the bill. Okay, another item that's come up is uh, WikiLeaks has been 
determined to be a hostile non-state intelligence service. <clears throat> Anybody have any comments on that? Um, what does that mean? I, I'm just reading from the, the press release. I don't know if determined is the right word. It's that, that's Label. the word that, that the, uh, the intelligence community has started using, I guess, to refer to them. I mean, this has um, some significant press freedom implications, right, which is, um, you know, if you get a news story you don't like, does that mean that it's a hostile non-state actor uh, from the press? Um, so, so that's sort of been the, the response that we've seen from a bunch of news organizations is that there's potentially bad precedent that comes out of this if there are any um, charges sort of curtailing uh, or, or prosecuting WikiLeaks for the releases of data because um, the, the way that they're set up, which parallels the news organization, uh, means that it's pretty hard to differentiate what they're doing from the sorts of journalistic activity that, that we do want to protect under, under our free speech and journalistic protections. Um, and that said, I think you know, we're entering this world around fake news or politically motivated leaks. We're seeing that happening in France right now, uh, where it's, uh, it's scary to governments, right, that, that some external entity can, can time and then cause press to manipulate your internal politics. Um, and I think, you know, it's unclear if the right response is prosecuting the people releasing that news because the news is likely to get out if some external state wants it, but more that um, we as a society need to understand the political motivations of this stuff more and we need to make sure that we're providing context and understanding what, you know, they want us to do and whether that's actually what we want to do. Uh, just like... Uh, sorry, just on the topic of WikiLeaks, uh, just to play devil's advocate, um, I feel that the reason that the intelligence community came to the conclusion that they did was less about the what WikiLeaks did as more and more about how they did it and how they and how they deliberately portrayed essentially non-news <coughs> matters like risotto recipes as a big scandal in a clear and bald-faced attempt to influence our political process. And I think it was that, more than anything else, which caused the intelligence agency to classify WikiLeaks as a hostile non-state intelligence agency. Uh, so uh, I think that, that part of part of Will's answer to this was that, uh, so I mean, the big, a big argument here is that, uh, or the context for this is like what is, WikiLeaks is unlike a lot of traditional uh, organizations that we've seen in, in, in the past. And so there's this question of what they are, people that don't like them and want to silence them, want to call them things that will make it easier for them to do that. Um, so hostile non-state intelligence agencies are things that I think the government feels that they're at some, they have some authority to go out and try to silence and stop. And journalists uh, are, they feel like that's harder for them to do. So uh, certainly WikiLeaks and lots of people that support them want to say, no, look, they're, they're, they look like journalists, they're acting like journalists, they're doing the job of journalists, they should be protected in the same way the journalists are, and people that, and, and, that, and that's part of the argument. Now, I think that, there's, that, that there are sort of two parts of that argument which I think are important and which are distinct. One is that they're, the way in which they work is the way in which traditional journalistic organizations have worked, and WikiLeaks has made that argument, um, and I think that there's some evidence for that. I think that there are also important distinctions. For me, the important uh, question is, Sort of this idea. I think there are important differences in the way in which WikiLeaks and lots of other kinds of organizations work, but th uh, that are doing the job that traditionally the fourth estate has done, right? Um, gather facts about the world, interpret those facts, disseminate those things, uh, comment on those things, right? The kinds of things that, that we have relied on the press to do. And I think that it is increasingly the case that those that, that work is not being done by traditional journalistic organizations. Um, it's being done by I don't know, maybe organizations like WikiLeaks, it's being done by, by groups on you know, subreddits, uh, it's being done maybe by BuzzFeed. I mean, that looks more like <laughs> BuzzFeed hires journalists, uh, at least, right? Um, whereas a subreddit, which is doing some of these same things, I think still doing the job, filling the role of journalism. And I think that it's important to the extent that we, that, that journalism is shifting, and this is not 
I don't know, I mean, I'm in a communication department, so like everyone might have run is like, I'm obsessed <laughs> with the ways in which, the specific ways in which this is happening. Um, for me, the, I think that there's, there's a lot to be excited about in terms of the new organizational forms which are springing up to do that job. But it is important in that context that we be willing to apply the same kinds of productions to those space, and I, to, to, those, to those spaces and those processes. Um, and, uh, and that it's worth, uh, you know, in the interest of free speech and the free press, erring on the side of a broader uh, form of production. I think we have much more to gain than we have to lose. Which is to say, yeah, so that's as a way of kind of answering your point. Yeah, I get you. Just as one final thing, I just feel that there's a big difference between commenting on the news and doing journalistic duty and taking an email out of context <coughs> to promote Pizzagate, which WikiLeaks has done. You know, like. But we get retractions and we get sensationalized headlines from a lot of things. Yeah, so I mean, WikiLeaks sensationalizes, WikiLeaks takes things out of context, but I think that is not a thing that we have traditionally said makes you lose any journalistic protections, right? BuzzFeed sensationalizes everything, and New York Times has had retractions for many, many years, and we don't then like prosecute them for getting a story wrong. Um, and so at what line are we going to say, well, this makes you, what, a hostile intelligence agency? Like, that's a big jump. I, the, I guess the point that I'm making is that WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks is 100% deserving of journalistic protections, but they also that also means that they have uh, responsibilities of journalistic integrity, and they are deliberately not living up to those standards. And I think the, the, the response to that is who arbitrates those standards, right? Do you want the government to be the arbiter of the standards of journalism and, and have that as a consequence actually result in the loss of journalistic privileges? So that, that, that really is the question. I guess the, the only other brief dimension I would add is that our system has strong whistleblower protections, right? And there was an, there was a, an effort in this instance, you know, with the Snowden revelations to kind of uh, silence the whistleblower, uh, but whistleblower protections don't really mean a lot if they're if the outlets are not there, right? If that end of the system is also not protected. Sure. So Mr. Stand up. Just a, uh, just a comment to that. There, one thing that I think we have a tendency to overlook, at least I have in the past, is that I forget that news is actually classified as entertainment. It's not, it, it doesn't always have to be factual as we've learned through the years. We've seen news stories throughout generations skew a message uh, with a bias one way or another. WikiLeaks would be no different than that, nor would social media as it emerges as a news outlet as individual reporters. So being able to put a box around this will may have some unintended Switzerland, or they put it in some other, you know, 
one of the sources you could use. I mean, with WikiLeaks, we get the source of where it's coming from. Suppose you have a Fox, they're kind of curating what our users I mean, but yeah, WikiLeaks can release things at whatever WikiLeaks is curating. They, 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 they have their own access. I don't, I don't think we mind having a dialogue, but one of the times so we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody can agree WikiLeaks has its agenda, right? It has a political agenda of their own. I'm not trying, I'm not judging it. I'm just saying they have a specific agenda. Oh, I, I agree they have an agenda, but what I'm saying is, regardless of what their agenda is, at least we're getting the source and we're getting these huge data dumps. Let's kind of go through it. No, actually, we're getting okay, selected. Okay, okay, yeah. that's not a private <laughs> my, my only two cents before I hand this on to Bill, just one second, right. is I just want to throw it out to be a provocateur here, but I sincerely believe this. We don't want to be in our own bubble either. I right. mean, the fact of the are there any physicists here in the room? Theoretical physicists, good. Think in terms of quantum mechanics, okay? When you observe something, we got two physicists. When you observe something, the theory goes, you change it. There is no such thing as an objective observer. And there is no such thing as an honest, truthful reporting of the news because what is the news? And I will tell you that all news broadcasting, going back to centuries before the Gutenberg Bible, Everything that has been published has a propagandistic purpose, and that is to influence you or to entertain you, which is a form of influencing you. It's intended to have an effect. That is the nature of communication. When you talk to someone, when I'm talking to you, it's not because I'm telling you a truth. It's because I'm trying to influence you, and the same is true for any publication. It's not good, bad, or indifferent. That's life. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we've gotten to, right, is, you know, we live in a globalized world. We can see the, um, the path that other countries have taken where the internet gets turned off around election season and you only get internal media broadcasts. Uh, that's, you know, one way of protecting your national sovereignty from external influences, but it's not necessarily the one that we're comfortable taking right now. Um, and so what does that leave us with? And I think, I mean, at some level, we have to hope that the answer we come to is education and critical thinking skills, where we can see these things and understand why they've happened and what their motivations are, and understand if you know the the underlying material that they're uh, sharing to make those points are actually things that we believe cause us to you know vote that way. This gentleman first, and then in the back. Uh, well, this hostile intelligence service, I think that's been kind of a claim about uh, newspaper correspondence for hundreds of years, that in fact, when you go and report on something, that is intelligence. And I think a lot of uh, totalitarian states basically are saying what the CIA guy is saying now. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, we've got, they can be arrested in Iran for reporting, they can be arrested in the United States for reporting. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it, it's, newspaper are, Intelligence sources, which are hostile. I mean, you know, so so you the summary of the question is the journal or the, of the statement is that journalists are well, categorized as hostile by the state and have, um, in lots of places, continue to be and have been forever. Even here. Yeah. Even here. Uh, you started to mention education, and I, I think I mean, we're all sitting in this room because we're interested in this, um, and so it's a lot easier for us because we're attuned to it to work on filtering some of the noise down to uh, a little more signal. Um, can you talk about with uh, the proliferation of fake news and WikiLeaks and media channels from every direction, how, like, as a society, and rather than us sort of elite individuals, how as a society we can help to funnel some of that? So, so. 10,000 foot view, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. part of the part of the challenge is that we have uh, uh, a situation in which private sector <coughs> corporations have a great deal of power to arbitrate, right? What the narrative looks like. Facebook alone has a tremendous amount of power to to do that. And I think uh, it, it, part of the challenge that we see is also that it's not transparent there's no accountability, right? So you are being put in an echo chamber based on an algorithm, right? But, but A, you don't necessarily know that you're being put in an 
echo chamber and you don't necessarily know what the basis of the algorithm is that it, 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 on, on which you are being put in that echo chamber and you don't know how the echo chamber works and you have no control over adjusting the settings, right? So, you know, you, you've probably all heard of this, this sort of experiment where someone kind of goes on YouTube and starts looking at videos and their experience is that the next thing that, that is a suggested video is just a more uh, extreme or radical version of the previous video they viewed such that eventually they're very, very deep down the rat hole, right? So the hope would be, right, that in an ideal world, you would actually be told and have some control over whether you wanted to go down that rat hole or whether we, you actually wanted uh, you know, a way to balance those perspectives. Uh, I think the, the bigger issue here, though, is that much of uh, the, the way uh, data moves around the world is, is going to be uh, automated, right? So this is the question of algorithmic discrimination that's on everybody's minds right now as we, as we sort of look at, look at the debate. I just came back from you know, a couple of sessions with Kate Crawford, who's a professor on the East Coast and one of the foremost exponents around artificial intelligence. And even she right, is sort of admitting that we don't have the ethical guidelines in place to be able to uh, uh, understand what we're doing around artificial intelligence, whose very premise is that as you go along, the algorithm alters itself so that even its makers don't know how it's making decisions. Right? So, I think the back end, the, the, you know, in addition to pressure on corporations to have more transparency and accountability, I think a, a back end is actually testing out right, how their, their algorithms are actually working in the real world, right? So black boxing, blue boxing, white boxing, to make sure that if these <coughs> algorithms are returning disparate results that, it, that have uh, disproportionate impacts, that that's that's known to them and they can actually do something to try to fix it. Um, so those are just some general thoughts. Uh, we don't, I think the, the real answer is we don't have an answer yet, but everyone's, everyone's worried. Sure. So uh, one comment that I just had on that is uh, one big problem with changing minds and reversing courses and influencing people is uh, the backlash effect. Uh, Matthew Inman of The Oatmeal recently did a comic about it. To make a long story short, it is a phenomenon where when you are presented with uh, uh, contradictory evidence, your belief in something actually grows stronger. And exactly. And uh, it is something that is very difficult for everyone to come to uh, overcome. The comment was just that sometimes you will get a backlash effect when you are staking out a position or corrective action and that people who believe differently will be reinforced, strengthened in their opposing belief. Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, uh, nobody said it yet, so I wanted to be the crazy guy in the room. I have a future that I believe in, and I've heard about um, like a kind of consistent theme of it's only going to get worse, like the internet's going to get bigger, we have to educate ourselves, and we're trying to push trust off onto systems that we don't control. Um, we can only take so much of the control ourselves. Uh, so there are uh, things that I believe in that I think can help. And when we talk about pushing transparency onto companies and pushing them onto larger systems or networks, uh, I think things like the blockchain and Ethereum give us like incredible power in that area. When we start to make everything transactional, when we have something that can be searched and something that can like, this is what happened, or if something happened and it didn't show up in the blockchain, Somebody subverted the system. It's clear. There's a, it's a black hole. The light is not there, but you can tell that it's gone. Uh, and then the other thing is, like in the interest of educating ourselves, uh, what uh, the gentleman over here is talking about, where we can't, like we get backlash when we're trying to uh, help people with things <coughs> and we're trying to explain these problems, I would just recommend that literally everyone in this room read the book, like Never Split the Difference, and then read the book fierce conversations, because uh, I think this is how we talk to people, and when we start to all understand that things are a negotiation and that things are a work in progress, maybe we can make progress. Um, I think we want to move on to a short comment. <clears throat> About a week ago, I was in downtown Olympia, and I saw a group of men in, with masks and hoodies, and I decided to leave the area hop on my bus and get home. After that, I didn't call the Olympian and let, the, let them know what was going on. I didn't call the New York Times. I 
posted to Facebook. I let my friends know that I was okay. And this apparently I'm part of the problem. I didn't, you know, I didn't do any journalistic integrity. I just posted to Facebook. Okay. What I what I think basically people are talking about at this point, they're talking about personal perspectives and in, in, in this case an anecdote about what's happening in Olympia and the prior commentator was talking about blockchains and technological approaches to having verification of authenticity, I, I believe would be a way to put it. There are some bright things. I'm going to move on to a different topic here because we are in a FOSS community. We're in a GNU Linux uh, community and one of the stories that happened, maybe the rest of the panel didn't find this amusing, but I did, uh, which is that you are finding farmers in North Dakota and in Nebraska are in revolt. Now they're revolting because they're objecting to what's happening when they buy their John Deere tractors. John Deere. Their tractors are coming with embedded software which they can't change. They can't, they don't even have the authority. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are unable to correct problems. They're unable to make <clears throat> software improvements. And they're concerned that A, only authorized dealers in John Deere software are able to do the fixes. And second, the concern is what happens when this equipment becomes obsolete? Are they going to be forced to buy new John Deere tractors when these are really not obsolete. They'd really rather not throw away their tractors after 10 or 20 years. They'd rather hack them and keep them running and they're being prevented from hacking them. And a related subject has to do with the squeeze on the educational system, which is forcing public schools to not buy books anymore, but it's having a curious side effect in that it's forcing them to do open source textbooks. That means on the one side they don't have money, which is bad, because I want public schools to have money, but on the other hand, they're getting away from the big national publishers and taking mm -hmm. information out of common areas and forming their own curricula. I don't know if this is something that brings up discussion or not. Uh, sure, and maybe if there are people that haven't asked questions yet, we can uh, hear, uh, hear from them first uh, or make comments. I have lots to say about these two things. Uh, um, uh, both of them. The, I think that I think that the the tractor situation is like, I mean, I, it, funny because it's tractors, but it's the same story we've seen in lots of other places with computers and cars and phones and lots of devices that used to be more open and have become more locked down in ways that annoy people. I think that in the case of tractors in particular, it just seems like a, such a. I mean, there's another dimension which is not mentioned in the I didn't see mentioned in the news on this, which is that it's this huge missed opportunity for John Deere because if you look at you know tractors have gotten and like farm equipment they get, they get larger and more complex and they do all kinds of crazy things now with computers but almost all of those things that tractors or farm equipment now do are things that farmers created by modifying their tractors in ways that the manufacturers had not thought of or did not want or didn't realize there was a market and I actually uh, one of my mentors when I was in graduate school was um, uh, taught this big innovation class where he talked about users innovating and he has a story about how one of his students worked for John Deere and said you're talking about all this crazy innovation that users can do by modifying and hacking their stuff but like come on tractors and they went and they did a search online and found a forum where there were tons of John Deere tractor users sharing modifications to their tractors. Um, and he was like, wow, that's so cool. And some of those things eventually then became products eventually that now John Deere sells for huge amounts of money. So it just seems like there's this crazy missed opportunity in terms of innovation. Open systems promote new extensions to those systems and new forms of functionality. Uh, people are willing to do all kinds of stuff as I think this conference and you know these communities, our, our communities are evidence of. And I think that that locking that out is a is a bad decision for it's, it's a bad decision for the manufacturers as well. Is John uh, Deere actively trying to keep them from doing that? John Deere, I mean, so I only know what I read in the story, but yeah. So, so in, in this context, and this is also very true of European automakers in the last couple of years. <coughs> I had the opportunity the last year um, to spend time with CIOs of a number of uh, European automakers, and the thing that is driving a lot of their decision making in this space, and I suspect it's at least one of the components of what's impacting John Deere, is they are 
just absolutely paranoid about the liability and consequences of being responsible for something that somebody else has. And I kept trying to explain to him that I thought this was completely ludicrous because he never really worried about, you know, you putting a screwdriver to the carburetor when it didn't have a computer between you and it. And so why all of a sudden somehow this, you know, big, ugly, scary thing called software should fundamentally change the way you think about the interaction with the systems? Uh, there's just, for me, there's a conceptual disconnect there. But I wonder if any of you have uh, thoughts or comments about sort of the extent to which <coughs> there ought to be some way for us to convince you know, the, the corporate participants in these various ecosystems that liability shouldn't be the thing they allow to make that decision. So, so the question is about uh, just the idea that liability, uh, that the argument made by companies like John Deere and European automakers and lots and lots of other companies for locking down devices in ways that are designed to make them more difficult to modify by owners of those devices is, one, is the argument that if those devices were modified and something horrible happened. If it's a tractor, you can imagine all kinds of horrible things happening. Um, uh, uh, the, the company would then become liable for whatever that uh, whatever that was. Um, I actually tried to do a research project on this with a law professor and uh, an innovation professor, and we were looking for examples of. Uh, the companies will definitely make these arguments. We were looking for examples of like I don't know, actual litigation in these sorts of spaces. The reality. Like our conclusion was that the degree to which this is a real concern in terms of liability is actually very, is that in the most generous sense, uh, very unclear. Um, that in part this seems to be, people people are, they're, you're always worried about what you don't know, um, about what could happen, but in part there are lots of other benefits to companies of having your systems locked down, like when they gotta buy, uh, when they gotta get it repaired, they have to go to one of your authorized dealerships, and the argument of like, oh no, no, it's just our liability concern, like sounds better than the argument, no, 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 we just really don't want you to buy, you know, like replacement parts from anyone other than us. Um, uh, and it's hard to disentangle those because I think that the companies that are making these arguments aren't very honest about it. Let's not forget about Volkswagen. <coughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. No, there were more comments. Oh yeah, there, there are more comments too, but I wanted to. Well, I was just going to say, I'm not sure it's a civil liberties issue. I, I tend to doubt that liability, liability is the fig leaf, right, that, that's covering the real reason, which is that they want your money. The solution is to buy someone else's tractors and or to hack your John Deere tractors and let them come back and challenge. Yeah. Uh, yes, sure. When I, eons ago, I was going to become a, a farmer. I studied to be a farmer. Um, I had a Honda a little while ago and it stopped working. The only way I could do it to get it hauled to the dealer and they could fix it. There was no way that you could fix it out in the field. They had to replace some component. The farmers are upset because if the crop has got to come in and the tractor is in the field and it stops, they want to get that tractor working as quickly as they can so they can get that crop in. It isn't going to be any satisfaction to them to say, you'll schedule me to come out and get my tractor, replace the electronic component, and then bring it back. It's rain between then. You've ruined your crop. They may like to modify it and all that, but what they're really worried about is getting that crop in. Like these, that, that a lot of the issues. I mean, I guess that I'd summarize both those comments as saying that a lot of the issues people might feel in their cars in a situation in, in, in a farming situation often they're more like 
extreme because you don't have time to wait. And I think one thing that showed up in some of the stories that I read about this was also just the fact that if you do need it fixed, like, and the nearest licensed dealership is 150 miles away, uh, that's a whole other element. So. Five minutes, please. Yep. So, um, this is not about tractor hacking. This is actually about the other piece on uh, school curriculum. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it has its upsides and downsides, right? Constitutionally in our state, education is the paramount duty of the state, and you also have to comply with uh, civil rights laws, right? And so there's a question of quality control as to whether you can actually verify the, the you know, the hack curriculum from open source um, uh, materials that are available online actually satisfies that. But assuming you can uh, verify that, it may actually be a way to the quality of your curriculum, right? And many teachers will tell you, right, that, that uh, localized curriculum actually can work better. Um, but of course, right, it can, it can also go the other way if you have a teacher that is sort of running off the rails, and is, has, has particular biases in one direction or another, if you don't have the quality control, then you may fall below those, those standards. Uh, to the extent it's a cost-cutting measure, it's probably not the best idea because actually, Writing curriculum takes a hell of a long time, right? And so you need to build that into your cost model and actually have, have teachers uh, be compensated for the time that they, they spend writing the curriculum. Um, so I don't know if it's going to save them much money. I'll just say that, like, the, the, this idea that um, there's this idea that, that anything that's like open is about hobbyists writing it or being hacked. The reality is, is that a lot, a lot of open educational resources that are being used in schools are created by professional like authors or teachers who have been hired and paid to do it um, by foundations with the idea of releasing these things freely. I mean, just because something is under a free license doesn't mean that it's unprofessional, created by obvious, uh, or bad or worse in any way. Um, and there are lots of reasons why, because this thing can be open and accessible to lots of, pe to lots of people, that you can bring resources to bear on the production of one of these, or textbooks or a set of curriculum that would, be, that would actually be hard to do. Um, uh, if you're working with individual school districts as well. So. Final comments, Will? Money? Uh, <coughs> I'm just giving you guys like a three minute cue. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're open at this point. If someone has a burning question uh, and it's not thick related, um, fire away now. Man. Um, so I want to ask about the whistleblower topic again because um, you mentioned that like whistleblower, like that's. Well, basically, I've seen more and more prosecution of whistleblowers, so I don't believe that like things are as free as they used to be. And I was wondering if, particularly the lawyers, if you could comment on the state of like whistleblower prosecution and if that's um, continuing to get worse as I see it from what I read in the news. Um, or yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, I I'll only make a very general. Uh, so the question was, what's the state of whistleblower protections in in light of uh, increasing use of, of prosecution of whistleblowers. I think there, that's a very valid question. I think my 10,000 foot view of that is that you know the, the state of the law remains basically what it was, right? We still have those protections technically. That of course doesn't stop prosecutions, right? And so if uh, uh, a prosecution isn't so frivolous that the prosecutor will get sanctioned, it may still be brought, right? And that is a concern because, of course, it ends up chilling the speech of others who might want to also follow in the footsteps of that whistleblower. Uh, and this is entirely apart from, you know, a culture that has more internal repercussions for whistleblowers within their own organizations as well, right? So I think the reality is they, they face consequences, and it, it really doesn't help that the government is also directing its resources against, against those individuals. And I guess I think what I'd say there is we've seen in the last three or four years a lot of very prominent examples of whistleblowing. And so while the we have seen consequences and we've seen very strong repercussions, but uh, I think to many people in the society there is now a much more awareness uh, both about what this process looks like and ways to be safe in doing so. So if you are going to go out and blow a whistle, uh, you can go to the New York Times secure drop site and anonymously provide this in a way that you are much less likely to be caught. Uh, and so we have seen also successful examples of documents being leaked 
and the impact of those documents happening without the person ever leaving their job or openly being known. And so those may become the successful example of whistleblowing is the source is never actually known and there are no repercussions against the source, right? The, the prosecutions, in a sense, may be 